Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so our topic today is mentoring the mentor. Oops, let me move this out of the way. Mentoring the mentor, how to guide, mentor, advise nursing doctoral students to a successful dissertation. I thank you all for coming to, to um, join us today. We'll go on to the next slide. Uh, hold on one second. Sure. Okay. All right. So um, as you know, this is uh, being held by the Nursing Care of Older Adults Special Interest Group in collaboration with GSA. According to GSA Connect, we are a super strong group. We have 569 members, and that was checked a few days ago, so maybe we have more. Um, if you're interested in what our charter statement says about us, we are a space for sharing of information, activities, and discussion related to nursing care of the older adult. Um, if you ever visit our GSA Connect um, area, you can actually find information about the charter um, in a folder in, the, um, in that organization. Um, I also encourage you, if you have any questions or comments or want to share anything, please do so on GSA Connect. We'd love to have um, an active community there. Uh, this, this webinar actually came about as a result of uh, one of the surveys that we put out um, last year about how, we would, how members would like to become more engaged um, with the interest group, as well as um, some of our co-conveners ideas on topics. Um, so if you have any other strategies for engagement, let us know, or even better, uh, join the leadership team. We'll be putting out a call for um, future co-conveners a little bit later in the fall. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So our agenda for our action-packed webinar today, um, we are starting with, of course, with introductions and discussion, um, and then we'll have the presentation by Dr. Christine Williams. Uh, we'll have some breakout sessions, so you can talk sort of in a smaller group through some of your questions and issues that you might have as a new mentor or even um, thoughts that you might share as a seasoned mentor. And then um, after our breakout sessions, we'll have some key takeaways. So I'm going to, um, hopefully I've given Justine enough time to use those qualitative analysis skills to uh, summarize some of the topics in the chat. So I'm gonna hand it over to her. Thank you so much, Joanna. So yeah, what I'm seeing so far in the chat is that a lot of our attendees are here because they just want to learn new things or they strive to be better. So they're just here for the, for the knowledge and the presentation, no particular skills um, that, that they're looking for, just um, general knowledge. Um, we do have some brand new mentors in the room as well as some seasoned mentors. So just looking for information. And then we had a couple things around um, how as, as mentors do we balance our own work life uh, while mentoring others? And then um, how do we balance micromanaging versus allowing autonomy? So if somebody's making a lot of errors on a paper draft, how, how do we manage letting them work on that? And um, how much feedback do we give them? So that, that seems to be, we're still getting people trickling in, but those seem to be the major themes. So thank you very much. And just as a reminder, if you are new, um, go back and put your name and organization affiliation in the chat and an issue or question you're facing as a new mentor. Um, we are going to be breaking into small groups, as Dr. Buck said, um, but we will um, be trying also to pay attention to some of those um, concerns throughout the webinar. Oop. And there is our agenda one more time. And um, we're right on, um, we're actually ahead of schedule. Um, so I'm going to actually take that minute and do it, uh, uh, offer an introduction to our uh, keynote speaker today. So I'm gonna stop sharing so people can kind of see each other and see who's here. We did ha have an impressive number, uh, about 60 people sign up for this seminar. So you're in good company. I expect more people might be coming in or watching the recording later, um, but I'm just really, really honored to be able to introduce my, uh, my former mentor and uh, colleague, uh, 
uh, Dr. Christine Williams, um, who is a uh, doctor of nursing science, advanced practice RN, psych mental health nurse practitioner board certified, and also board certified in um, wellness coaching uh, through AHNCC. So she has a story career in advancing health of older adults, beginning with her MSN in psych mental health nursing. Her notable positions, among others, have included the senior nurse researcher to the geriatric research Education and Clinical Center at the Miami VA Medical Center, and as an executive board member of the Miami Geriatric Education and Clinical Center MAGIC, which was a HRSA-funded interdisciplinary center at University of Miami School of Medicine with a mission to educate professionals about geriatrics. In 2000, she became a charter member of the steering committee of the Florida Teaching Nursing Home, sponsored by ACA, Agency for Healthcare Administration, whose mission was to improve the quality of care in nursing homes in Florida. This work on that committee highlighted the critical role of nursing in the care of institutionalized older adults with dementia. In 2007, she was appointed professor at Florida Atlantic University and then moved on to distinguished professor. And then she continued her research on older adults and caregiving and couples, uh, communication among couples uh, facing dementia. And in 2019, she retired from her role as director of the PhD in nursing program, but she continues to teach and conduct research and mentor uh, as a professor emeritus. She has received numerous awards for her mentorship, including but not limited to the William R. Johnson Most Valuable Mentor Award, uh, which is from the McKnight Doctoral Fellowship Program, Florida Atlantic University's Excellence in Graduate Mentoring Award, the Florida Nurse Excellence Regional Winner in Mentorship, and the Mentor Award from Sigma. She is a fellow in GSA. She's mentored countless students in timely completion in their doctoral studies and beyond, assisting them with procuring faculty positions at top tier institutions. We are very thankful that she's generously sharing her time and thoughts and speaking with us today regarding mentoring doctoral students. So thank you, Dr. Williams. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm going to share my screen as soon as I figure out here what I want to share. Um, okay, so I don't know if I'm sharing the right screen. So we see your, um, we see you in presenter view, so we could see two yeah. slides at once. Okay, let me switch. There you go. Getting there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to now share this screen. I, yeah. I think if you go to slide um, show. Yeah. Um, OK, now we're seeing your Zoom. Yeah. Right. There you go. And then slideshow. And you'll be in great shape. Oh, I'm still doing it backwards here. How's that? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I see I'm getting a transcription here, automatic transcription. I hope that's not too distracting. But at any rate, um, I'm glad to be here and thank you for your wonderful introduction. And it always sounds better than reality when you um, hear your own introduction. But I you did leave out that I was uh, associate professor at University of Miami School of Nursing for 13 years before coming to Boca Raton and Florida Atlantic University. And so I've, I've been um, teaching doctoral students in two universities and also in addition to, as, as Lisa pointed out, directing the PhD in nursing program at Florida Atlantic University. So I've, I've had lots of different experiences and I'll draw on those experiences <clears throat> tonight as we talk. I thought I'd start off by mentioning that when I looked at this title, Success in Dissertations, I thought of it as being a little bit broader that we want students to be have successful dissertations for sure, but we want them to have a great start on a successful career and to um, 
learned that, you know, doctoral studies more than just coursework and credits. And there's just so much more to learn that you can't find in a book and you may not hear about in a course. And yet somehow you still have to know what those things are. Uh, my own experience with academic advising was that it was more about what are the courses I needed to take? How many credits did I, you know, when was I going to meet deadlines and um, graduate, you know, according to the plan? Whereas a mentor can be someone who is, you're going to maybe develop a very long-term relationship with. In some cases, it could be a lifelong relationship with, uh, as with Lisa, you know, we've turned into colleagues. And so with, with that in mind, I always like to think about mentorship as being uh, possibly a lot more than being an advisor. For one thing, you may be assigned to be an advisor, but being a mentor is really more your choice than uh, being matched with an advisee that may or may not match exactly with your research interests or your way of working and mentorship may not develop in every case. So there's a number of ways that mentor, mentor relationships can happen. And it may be that you uh, above and beyond students that you've been assigned to, you may take an interest in a promising student that you have in a course or that you notice in some other environment and start to get to know that student a little bit better and it develops into a mentor-mentee relationship. Sometimes students seek your mentorship from someone that they admired because they had you in a course or they saw you do a presentation and um, they thought that your work was something that they would like to be a part of. Uh, and that's kind of an ideal situation. But the process, what is this whole process of mentorship like? I believe what works best is that you are combining advocating for them, cooperating with them and even collaborating with them <clears throat> more so than being that um, person who knows everything and has all the answers and make sure that they do what they need to do and take the next steps in order to make it to the next semester. I like to encourage students to make their own decisions early on because I think one of the things that's so important to success in, in an academic setting or in a research setting is the ability to be motivated, self-motivating, and um, having that inner drive to reach your goals and persistence about meet, meeting goals. Those are the kinds of things that um, we want to develop in students and we don't want to discourage. Um, Getting them to opportunities is another thing that mentors can do. Mentors have a very broad um, view of the research opportunities that are available, the student opportunities that are available, such as uh, teaching assistantships, research assistantships, uh, opportunities for awards and recognition, giving presentations. And so we can guide mentees to be sure that they're aware of those opportunities and give them a chance to, to take advantage of it. Another point about get mentoring and um, setting up an uh, ideal mentorship situation is that you're not the only person mentoring that individual and you don't want to be. So much of science is team science. It's science that goes beyond nursing as a discipline, it's interdisciplinary, it's international, it's um, leadership in a, a large group maybe or a team of researchers. So making available those opportunities to become part of a team, I think is really, really helpful if you can do that from the beginning. And how do you make this uh, not so much work for yourself is to think about 
all the things that you do and how could I involve my mentors in those experiences so that I'm not making more work for myself necessarily, but working with them and exposing them to the things that I'm involved in. Peer mentorship is another possibility and many other disciplines do this as well. So that if you have a first year um, mentee and then and a second year mentee, you have the uh, second year work with the first year and so on, as well as with other members of your research team. I wanted to talk about relationships with mentors and men between mentors and mentees, because I think many times problems arise in terms of relationships um, and we can't, we're all different. We have different norms in the institutions where we work. We can't necessarily work as well with everyone because of our own individual needs, our time available, our way of working. And so these are things to consider. Some people will be a student, uh, maybe you may feel a sense of compatibility, that they're likable, that you have mutual understanding that's maybe kind of effortless. Other people, not so much. And um, I have found in my, in my experience that even a difficult relationship can, can become sort of an acquired taste over time that as you work things out with that, with that individual and are they teachable? Are they willing to learn um, on how they need to work together with you to be successful? In these post COVID days, some of us may have not have the experience anymore of having that ever present student who is standing outside your office door when you arrive in the morning, or they always seem to have a need or a pressing a question. <clears throat> and on the other extreme, you may have a student that is never present and that you know the whole semester could go by and you may not see them at all unless you try to reach out to them. So these are things I think that we can teach students that there is, you know, there are many, many um, lessons about professionalism and about how to work with a mentor that will help them to be more successful, like how you want them to make appointments with you. What do you want? Do you want them to send you an email? Do you want them to send you what they're working on before making an appointment with them? What is your process? So educating them about that. Um, and also I tell students who are the ones who are never present, that if they are not visible and I don't get to know them, I'm not going to necessarily think of them first when an opportunity arises for recognition or for a scholarship or for um, participation in research, all the different opportunities that can, uh, can be so important for a student's success. And so it's up to them to make sure they are visible. <clears throat> Assessing scholar, re scholar readiness, I think is another thing that's important. And maybe it's my mental health background, but I'm looking for someone that I can work with. It has a healthy sense of self-esteem. And I think people in it who are in academics and maybe people who are seeking PhD degrees and can fall into the cat category or extremes of maybe, maybe being overconfident or in some cases having such a fear of failure that they um, are slowing themselves down. I talk about perfectionism leading to paralysis. The student who is, wants everything they do to be so perfect that they have a hard time getting started and a hard time showing their work to someone who uh, they admire and who think they think is perfect, which of course none of us are. Um, students need to be open to um, critique and feedback in order to have 
a good working relationship with a mentor. And so that I think is something that um, I look for. And on the other hand, um, if they have such a fear of failure that they drag out their work, say uh, their independent work, then it's, it's gonna be added years to graduation. There are other, there are methods of overcoming this in addition to the, you know, the one-to-one -one advising that you do, but students aren't always open to these things when you may see a need for it. They don't quite see that need, like a PhD peer support group. In um, my work as director of the PhD program at Florida Atlantic University, we did set up peer PhD support groups Students didn't always attend. And so then we decided to try to do it online, have an online support group. And that didn't always work out because their schedules were so different. But um, once they get into working on their dissertations, they seem to be, it seems to become much more relevant and some of them do it on their own at that stage. Writing groups are another thing that you can set up and, and setting them up on Zoom now is a lot easier and students may be able to make themselves available to um, be a part of a writing group so that they can start out giving each other feedback and giving each other encouragement to start writing and um, before they have to show it to someone that their fear of embarrassment might prevent them from doing. We've offered workshops on abstract writing as a way to encourage students to support an abstract for a conference or for something that's coming up where we'd like to have a good showing with students submitting abstracts because they needed a lot of help with writing abstracts. And when accepted, they needed a lot of help with um, even creating a PowerPoint for their presentation. So let's see, that's name one, here we go. I think it's important to give students a realistic idea of what they can expect. Um, you know, it's, it's hard work, struggle and setbacks for many students, most of us, at least some of the time. And that this is not going to be like it was when you were taking courses and because you had a great memory, you got A's and everything. It's now it's not about having a great memory or working in isolation. Um, it's more about originality and working with others in teams and so forth. So it's a, really a, a change for many students. They're not going to get that A and just, you know, the job is done, now I move on and get an A in the next course. There are things going on in the background outside of coursework that is, are equally important, like working on your writing, for instance. And they need to know that even though they get feedback that isn't exactly what they'd hoped for, that this is a necessary part of the learning process and it's just expected and it happens to everyone no matter how experienced you are. And so it's something they need to learn to appreciate and um, not be devastated by. Also looking for approval um, is not going to be uh, a way to be successful and move forward. Some mentors are not going to give a lot of approval. They're gonna see more critique than they do great writing or awesome argument in your writing. Um, they're gonna to have to learn to expect mistakes and rejections and lower than expected grades or not being selected for something and that this is something they have to pick themselves up from and move forward. Uh, as a mentor, we can broaden their perspective and, and ex tell them that they need to expect this. They need to read widely outside their discipline and they need to explore all kinds of options. 
Also, they need to communicate fresh ideas to contribute to research. So if you want a successful mentor-mentee relationship, one of the things that they can contribute are their fresh ideas and how to work together. And that's something that you want to expect. You're looking for someone with originality and who is staying abreast of the literature and can point to things that are useful to you too. They need to communicate their needs and expectations. If they expect to hear back from you in a certain time frame, they have to get buy-in from you that this is realistic. They need how to show respect for the mentor, the profession, and the field of research. For example, being aware the mentor's time is limited, that they need to make a request for an appointment, however you want that to happen. Maybe you're informal and a text will be fine. Others may want a, um, an email and they may want something in the email, exactly you know, an agenda for what the meeting would be um, all about. So if that's what you would like, then you need to communicate that. Letters of recommendation can't be requested the day or two days before they're due. Um, work should be submitted after they have gotten way beyond the first ugly draft. And so they submit their best work because that's all part of respecting their mentor. Mentors have an amazing opportunity to teach the disciplinary standards and doing that by example. It's not just ethical conduct of research as you learned in an online course, but show having your mentor demonstrate ethics in research is so much more powerful. I like to teach students what to do by uh, having a session where maybe um, they, you know, doing the teach and then teach back and even recording an interaction between myself and the student where we're doing role playing and um, then be able to give them feedback on how they did consenting this um, role playing situation, consenting the volunteer research participant, maybe doing testing or whatever is required as part of that study to be sure that they understood what they needed to do. In this way, we can protect uh, our mentees from, for, from misconduct that does happen and so that they can get pulled into. And so we need to be um, vigilant about that. So being explicit is this, you know, it's an invaluable thing. Even though authorship is not necessarily part of a dissertation, in a way it is because they are as you are working with them toward a dissertation, they are beginning to get experience in scholarly writing, which they will need in order to be able to write their dissertation. To be, we had qualifying exams at both University of Miami and Florida Atlantic University. Part of that was written. And so students who'd never written a journal article were at a severe disadvantage. So as you work with students, you might have an opportunity where you're in a course and they write a paper and you think the paper has potential and you encourage them to work on the feedback you've given them and to submit it for publication. That publication could go on beyond the semester, but that's one way it could happen. Another way might be that um, you're working on a a manuscript and you invite them to participate. So they want to be authors and students can be um, quite, I think, confused about how to get to be an author and not understanding they have to make significant contributions to the work. They have to know that there's a process for be, the order of authors and that there is a reference in APA about that, but that's something that we as mentors need to educate them about so that there's not hurt feelings and confusion later on in the process. Uh, 
we also um, want to keep encouraging them about dissemination and that publishing, presenting, these are all parts of their education that a mentor will um, be part of and encouraging. So as we go about doing presentations, we want to teach them choose audiences wisely. Don't do the same thing over and over again. Um, repetitive presentations or doing service over and over again, doing what's familiar and comfortable. Professional organizations are excellent ways to have visibility and, and to find people that you can network with. However, it all has to be in moderation. And those are judgment calls that a mentor can be very helpful with. So this just mentions about getting these person to um, understand that all about authorship early on in the process of planning a publication. And that their role may change that they don't necessarily, because they started out hoping to be first author, doesn't mean they necessarily end up first author if they didn't merit that with the, kind, the work that they put into the manuscript. Lead authorship conventions vary depending on the institution and the discipline or rather the journal and the <clears throat> discipline and that's something that they need to know about. Submitting a manuscript is, is complicated and there's a lot that they can learn from a mentor that they're not gonna learn from necessarily what I think of as an academic advisor, that they um, need to choose a journal and choose wisely. They can't publish something that they have previously published just by translating it into a different language, for instance. They don't necessarily understand about different types of journals, different fo focus, like nursing versus interprofessional, theory, practice, education, research, focus journals. It's overwhelming for them. They may not understand impact factors, open access, and often writing to a very specific audience. If they want a chance of having a manuscript um, accepted, they really have to be cognizant of that specific audience that they are writing to. Some of them will overestimate the value of their work and think that this is a topic that no one else has ever written about. And therefore I should try to publish it in the um, journal with the highest impact, impact factor and the widest audience, which we know is unrealistic in a beginning student. Um, they also are vulnerable to predatory practices, predatory journals writing to them and inviting them to publish or present at a conference that maybe doesn't even exist. So we have to educate them about that. The whole review process can be devastating when they finally do submit to a journal and don't fully understand the um, review criteria and how it's going to be judged and are shocked maybe by the uh, feedback that they get. They need to know that they, they will be blind reviewed, but the editor will make the decision and then they will get a critique and uh, they have to decide then with whatever whoever is authoring that paper, is it worth it to try to revise and resubmit if you're invited to revise and resubmit? Or what many students in my experience want to do is not change a thing and just send it to a different journal because they don't quite believe that the feedback they've received is um, accurate. So helping them to understand that it's probably, if you get an invitation to resubmit or address the critiques, then do do that. It's Even if you decide to go to another journal, those criticisms are extremely valuable to help you improve your manuscript. So many of these things, how long does it take to hear from a journal? It depends. 
Um, what is the benefit of open access? Um, a student, you don't want a student to be spending large fees for something that may not be worth the, the, the fee, helping them to weigh what is the benefit of um, open access versus print journal or combination. And then the review, helping them to filter th through the comments in a review, to separate them out, to see the positives as well as the negatives. And hopefully there won't be any review or sarcasm or hostility or hidden contempt. Um, sometimes I think reviewers get very, very frustrated with beginning students and the quality of what they have submitted. But um, it's, you know, the mentor can be extremely helpful and supportive in helping them to deal with that and help them to see the way forward. How can these um, problems be addressed so that you can revise this manuscript and hopefully it will be accepted eventually. So successful mentors, I think, are humble but confident. They're humble in that they're not uh, dictatorial. They have made all of their own mistakes or many mistakes in the past and understand that mistakes can often be fixed and that um, still they're confident in their ability to, you know, to guide the mentee and to share their experience. The joys of appreciating the mentee. It's such a privilege to mentor someone and to be part of their growth, part of their discovery and their learning. Finding teachable moments is something that can be very exciting too, when it's really going to mean something to that mentee because it's a moment where it's now relevant and important to them. Sharing what has worked for you in the past or not worked uh, is, is something that a successful mentor does so that their mentee doesn't make the same mistakes that they have made in the past. And also I think demonstrating to mentees that growth is ongoing and that we as mentors are still learning and growing and um, we, you know, expect to do that for as long as we're involved in, in research and academic work. So I think I'm, I'll stop right there and see if there are any questions or any comments at this point. Yes, I think we, uh, the committee decided that we would go ahead and um, not do the breakout uh, rooms so that we really didn't have to interrupt your amazing presentation. And we can, I think people are going to really benefit from hearing everyone's questions and comments. Um, so uh, before we move into that, is there anything else you wanted to say from your presentation, Dr. Williams? Uh, not at this point. I'll have a couple of comments at the end. <clears throat> okay, then you can go ahead and stop sharing and we'll bring everyone together for the question and answers. All right. Thank you so much for that. There are so many golden nuggets in there. I almost don't know um, I figure uh, out where to, uh, to start. Um, but um, I think uh, uh, we will just open it up for some um, questions. Um, and comments to the large group. And um, I think um, I'm gonna stop sharing and then- Yeah, I'll... please do. Okay. You can help me out with that, I think. Uh... Okay, great. And then there we go. Um, and um, so uh, I will start with the first question and that is um, uh, with, uh, one of the questions that came up in the in the preliminary, which was how do you juggle the um, work life balance with trying to mentor um, students, uh, student or students and and keep to your schedule? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, so much is orienting students to um, your way of working. And that, um, like for me, you know, being hovering outside of my door when I show up in the morning isn't what I'd like to see when I first walk into work or, you know, being texted 
today is more texting or I don't, you know, necessarily want to see that either. I want people to um, be a little less impulsive maybe and respectful of my time, but I have to let them know that. And that's, you know, and I have to block out the time that I need for my own writing and for exercise and for eating healthy and all of those things. I mean, that's my responsibility to do that. And if the student isn't going to get the appointment in two days that they wanted, that's, you know, this is how I work. And that's part of the um, orienting them to this is, this is what the relationship is going to be like. Wow, that is really great. So um, organizing your own schedule and letting them know um, what your expectations are. Um, I, I know that one thing that you've done that's been a tremendous help uh, for me, and I've modeled that, is, is setting up a, a monthly meeting, you know, with your mentee. Um, you know, so that was, you always knew you were going to have that time, you know, as a student with your mentor and you would address, you know, everything then. And then, you know, things got busier, got closer to, you know, proposal or dissertation. It might be a little more often than once a month, but I think having those predetermined meetings was really key. Um, yeah. I agree because the, the student who's never around really benefits from that. Exactly. Okay, so other people, questions. Um, okay, Darina, you raise your hand, you can go ahead. Sure, thank you so much for your, um, for your presentation. My question has to do with uh, whether you uh, mentor your PhD students together as a group or meet with them individually and how to facilitate the peer mentoring uh, between them, themselves um, that you've talked about in your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so if there are common um, things that you can mentor people about, like they're submitting a manuscript, uh, submitting a, yeah, they might be working on a manuscript together or they may be submitting an abstract to the same conference that's coming up. Um, and then I could help mentor them together. Um, or they're all students who are maybe having, planning for a comprehensive exams. And so a group meeting when you're gonna say basically the same thing to all of them might be in order. Um, setting up peer mentoring, we've we did that at uh, Florida Atlantic University. In some cases it worked out terrific. I mean, we had students who were further along in their studies mentoring brand new students. That was outside of anything that I did individually. We did that for everyone. And some of those relationships worked out really, really well, others not so much. And so you kind of have to monitor that. In one case, I remember a student who was a new student just asking way too much of the peer mentor, wanting the peer mentor to edit their papers basically before you know turning them in. So it can work wonderfully and but nothing ever is perfect. You know, um, something uh, that I want to, um, an addendum to that is um, Dr. Williams' um, creation of the, the uh, peer support groups actually um, um, kind of evolved into uh, what we call a PhD cafe, um, where um, uh, you know, as often as the students decide they want it, um, and I'll talk about how we know that in a moment, um, whether it's once a quarter or once a month, uh, they come together um, on Zoom and they do it kind of like a happy hour, you know, where you can wear, you know, like we've done in the past, like wear fun hats or something like that. And they invite faculty. Um, and I see your note, Sherry. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and um, and that has become a really popular uh, way for, especially as Christine said, the, uh, the students who are now in dissertation phase and aren't seeing each other in their core classes, um, it, for them to connect and they really rely on that. 
And uh, one thing that we've done that's been really important is, um, again, this was Christine's uh, doing before she left, was we um, have a student representative on our PhD advisory committee. So uh, that student representative always comes to the beginning of the monthly PhD advisory meeting, you know, the program committee meetings, um, and shares concerns where she has, she's, she's chosen uh, by the faculty usually, um, you know, someone we know who's really connected to the students, but we'll, we also ask people if they're interested. But so she is really a conduit for sharing the concerns of the PhD students with the PhD advisory committee and, um, and vice versa. You know, she's able to take back concerns the committee has, and it's really created this beautiful channel of communication. Um, and that's where we find out some of the needs that students have as far as peer to peer mentors, um, you know, and, and who needs um, who wants to have a peer to peer mentor. It, it really is that student representative who's kind of like the class president in a way to um, coordinate those activities. And Joanna, I notice has her hand up. So first of all, I wish I'd had this talk before I started taking PhD students because I think as a new um, a new mentor, you sort of think to yourself like, what do I have to share? <laughs> and your slides, I, you know, I kept thinking, oh my god, I did know how to do that. Yeah, I I know how to do that. So I think having that confidence, um, kind of going into it. Uh, would have would have been really helpful. And then um, the one of the thoughts that I had was, you know, I just didn't want them to fail on account of me. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to be the one that like held them back. But uh, I think what you were saying about all of these different points that we know how to do as you know, people coming out of our PhD or as assistant professors, um, and just to sort of be confident in that. But I guess my question for you would be. Um, now, now armed with that knowledge that we know things, <laughs> um, is there sort of like a minimum to start out with? Um, and do you have any suggestions on, you know, say your, your program wants you to take like three to start out? How, how do you sort of navigate that? Well, some students take very little time because they seem to resist you know, being mentored even. Maybe it's the lack of confidence and may, unfortunately they may, you know, be the ones that you don't give as much time to and others are more ready to take advantage of everything you have to offer. So I don't think all students are ready for the same amount of intensive engagement. You know, they may have a lot of family responsibilities. They may have a, a executive position and they're, they don't have any time right now. And they're hoping that somehow in their PhD program, they'll find some time later on. So <laughs> they're not all equal in their needs at all at the same time. Especially if they're not, well, if they're all beginners, they're, they're in that same place, but um, different students will need different amounts of your help depending on so many factors. So I guess I'm saying, you know, you can handle three. <laughs> that's just, I mean, that's an, an, an important point to, to have, like that, that everyone is, there are diverse perspectives, there are di diverse experiences and how you, how I might've been as a PhD student might not be, um, you know, how another PhD student is and sort of being open to that. Um, I, I think that's a, a really important point to make too. So thank you. We did structure it in a way that I thought was helpful in that we developed a form that students, every student had to meet with their advisor at the end of every semester and complete, you know, what courses they had taken, um, what abstracts they had submitted, what manuscripts they had submitted or were working on, you know, what presentations they had done, reminding them every semester you need something to go in this box. You should be working on these things. And so then they would have their meeting with you and have to discuss, you know, where their strengths were and where, where they need to, needed to focus more. And so that was a good way, I think, of keeping people on track. It was a minimum amount, that one meeting a semester, but it's still, I think it was still really helpful. 
Justine, were there other things that the, from the beginning chat that we need to discuss with Dr. Williams? Uh, I, I'm not sure how much this was covered in the presentation, but somebody was asking about micromanaging versus allowing um, autonomy earlier in the chat, especially if somebody's um, having some errors in their work. That is a tough one because we have students who English is a second language, or they just come with different writing abilities. And it's, you know, we did have a course that students could take. And part of that course was working on scientific writing. But if there isn't something like that, um, maybe, I mean, we also had a center for excellence. We could send writing, excellence in writing, we could send students to to get extra help for writing if they needed it. Micromanaging is not going to help them to learn. You know, they need to have, they need to be somewhat self-directed. And although everyone writes that ugly first draft, you would not want to show that as um, to your professor or your mentor until you had worked on it some more. Um, read it out loud to yourself, have your family and friends read it, you know, if, if your writing is that bad. They have to figure out for themselves too how to improve their writing. Doing their writing for them doesn't necessarily um, help them in the long run. I mean, I, sure, I give feedback on writing and make suggestions for edits, but I try not to do it too, too much um, <clears throat> because you will just get frustrated yourself and um, probably not introducing the student to all the resources that are out there to help them with writing. Anybody else maybe have a suggestion on that? No, oh. nope, not a suggestion. I was gonna ask, I, I guess one final question because I know you had a, a wrap up slide too. Um, what what would be the biggest, and I think this goes to probably your wrap up, for me being a brand new faculty member and going to be assigned students, what would be the biggest advice that you could give me? As a, if you were the student? No, as a brand new faculty member. Oh. And, yep, and the program saying, we're going to give you some students and... Um, I think from what Joanna was saying, like, okay, confidence sounds like, you know, go in with confidence. <laughs> but any, anything else for a brand new faculty member that you could share? I think, um, you know, enjoy the process. Look at how far you have come, that here you are and you're going to be mentoring brand new students who have ideas that may turn out to be, you know, a scientific revolution. So many students have exciting, wonderful ideas that you would never think of on your own. They're from different backgrounds and different geographic locations. And uh, it's just so much fun to see their creative ideas and see the possibilities that they often don't even see themselves yet. But you think, wow, this is really going somewhere. And I'm going to get to be there to see it happen. That's really, really exciting. So to enjoy that process and um, you know, make that your reward for the time and effort that you're putting in, helping them to um, see the possibilities that they have, the potential that they have. And that, you know, they belong there too. They got there because they belong there in that role in the PhD program, and you can help them reach their goals. I mean, how fun is that? How exciting is that? That is so true. And there are a couple of comments in the chat about, um, you know, remembering Dr. Levitt's rights, remembering the joy of the experience, you know, focusing on that. So yeah, really, really grateful for that. And um, yeah, I think you've given us a lot of nuggets for as a new faculty member, you know, being organized, structuring your time, knowing the expectations, uh, maybe negotiating with your administration on how many students you can take while trying to do your own um, research trajectory, you know, and, and uh, team, I love that thing about how you said it's, you know, team sport, you know, you're not going to be the only mentor. So, and, um, and, also, one thing I just want to throw out there, you know, we have a lot of students who do need help with writing and, you know, sending them to the writing center and asking them to get help before they submit anything to you, I think is, is really helpful. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just have like two minutes left. Uh, we did want to share this one slide. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do that. Um, Dr. Chase is going to uh, talk just the closing here with what we have coming up for our nursing care of older adults interest group. First, thank you again, Dr. Williams, for sharing all of your um, words of wisdom and um, making us all feel really exciting, excited about being mentors ourselves. Um, so thank you. I also want to thank all of you for coming to join us and wanted to share some upcoming events. Um, so our business meeting and is October 11th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. We will have a nursing home leader, leadership panel that will um, come and talk to us about the new report and about uh, questions and challenges on implementing implementation of um, that report. And then um, please save the date for our in-person IG meeting um, and Doris Schwartz presentation that's set for November 3rd, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, in Indianapolis. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you all again for your time and for coming and uh, joining us. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Williams. And uh, thank you, Gina, for uh, moderating everything and all the logistics. And thanks to all of the co-conveners, uh, Lisa, Leah, and Justine, for um, helping push this through. Yeah, this was just a um, fantastic session. Thank, thank you, Dr. Williams and the committee. Thank you all so much. Yeah. So um, give your evening back to you now, and I hope everyone has a, a blessed night.